Okay, good evening everyone, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends. It's my great pleasure to welcome you for the annual Mellon Shell Lecture, which constitutes, as you all know, the most prestigious event organized by the Manchester International Law Center every year. And as you also know, this Mellon Shell Lecture Series was established in 1961 and has ever since been delivered by many renowned and acclaimed international lawyers. And I can only mention a few, namely Rob Jennings, Ian Sinclair, Dan O'Connell, and after an interruption between 1974 and 2014, John Dugard, that was in 2014, and Judge Shue in 2015. This year's annual lecture will be delivered by Michael Wood, Sir Michael, whom I welcome warmly in Manchester and whom I will introduce in a moment. Let me stress that this year's annual Mellon Shield lecture is very spe special for three reasons. First, and that goes without saying, the, this year's annual lecture is stands out because of the credential of our very distinguished guest and the relevance of the topic of the lecture of today, which is immunity of state officials. Second, this year's annual lecture is special because it is the third Mellon Shield annual lecture since Professor Ian Scobie and myself revived the series three years ago thereby confirming that the Mellon Shield Lecture Series has now been solidly and, I hope, definitely resuscitated. Last but not least, this year's annual lecture is very special because we have the pleasure to welcome Mr. Delaware, who will shed light on the person to whom we owe this lecture series, namely uh, Olive Schill. After years looking for more information, about, about Olive Schill and, and, and her family. We are now about to learn more and know more about, about her. So I warmly thank Mr. Dillaway for travelling to Manchester today. Mr. Dillaway will say a few words about uh, Olive Schill uh, and her family before Sir Michael delivers the annual Mellon Schill lecture. Before I pass the floor to Ian Scobie and later to <coughs> Michelle Arra, who will introduce Wilnet as well as Mr. Dillaway, I have the honor to present Sir Michael, even if Sir Michael obviously needs no introduction. Well, Michael Wood is, as many of you know, member of the International Commission. He also happens to be a senior fellow at the Law Department Center for International Law at the University of Cambridge. He's a barrister at 20 Essex Street, London. He was legal advisor to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office between 1999 and 2006, after having had a long career at the FCO. He's regularly acting as counsel before international courts and tribunal, and I could not simply list all the cases he's been involved as counsel uh, lately. And the students will know this, he's special rapporteur of the International Commission on the topic of the identification of customer international law, having produced not less than four reports, as well as a series of draft conclusions on the matter. And these reports, as well as the conclusions that have been provisionally adopted by the International Commission, constitute an invaluable source of insight for all of us, scholars, students, and practitioners. And there are many students in the room tonight, and they're all very familiar <coughs> with Sir Michael's work on customs. So Michael, it's an immense pleasure to, to, to have you here tonight. Let me say on a personal note, and also on behalf of, of Ian, that having you delivered the the Mellon Shield annual lecture has been a, an old dream and, and we are absolutely thrilled today and honoured to, to make it happen. Before wrapping up and passing the floor to Ian, a few words of gratitude. I would like to thank Cara, who has been the mastermind behind this event, as well as Echelle and John, for their generous help in organising this, this evening. As I continue to repeat, any success is theirs, and any mishap is to be attributed to the eccentric director of the centre. 
Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague, thank you all for coming tonight. I wish you a pleasant and inspiring evening. I'm not going to say a great deal, because um, John, I think, has, has covered some of the things I, I wanted to discuss. The Mellon Shield lectures were set up as a result of a bequest that Olive Shield made in memory of her brother Mellon, who was killed in 1916. We really don't know very much about Olive, so we're really pleased that Mr. Dulloway is here tonight to tell us a bit more about the only way that she's commemorated at all is, in, is by the Women in International Law Network, which is also known as the Olive Shield Society. Women in International Law Network is a, a, it was funded by female, female researchers in the Manchester International Law Centre. It really aims to give a platform to provide a community for women international lawyers at any stage of their career. I'm going to hand over now to Isho, who is um, head of the, the uh, Women in International Law Network, so she can introduce Mr. Dilbert. Thank you. Oh, and will you turn off your mobile phones, please? <laughs> All I remember. Good evening, everyone. The Mellon Shield Lecture Series first started thanks to the income generated by the bequest left by Olive Shield in memory of her brother, Mellon Shield, who died during World War I. Although Mellon Shield, many will have heard of his name, the name behind this lecture series has been overlooked. And as female researchers of the Manchester International Law Centre, when we founded the Women in International Network, we dedicated our initiative to Olive Schill to commemorate her contribution to international law and to the University of Manchester. Before Sir Michael Wood delivers today's lecture, I'd like to introduce Mr. Graham Dilloway, who has a special interest in the history of Manchester, and he also grew up near Croston Towers, Elderly Edge, where the Schill family lived. He contacted Milk after he watched the 2015 lecture where it was stated that very little was known about Olive Schill. So today he's going to give us a presentation on the lives of Olive and Melon Schill. Thank you very much, Mr. Dilloway, for taking part in today's lecture. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Sir Michael, professors. Um, I've got 10 minutes to rattle through this, so if anybody wants to ask questions, perhaps later, if you would be so kind. Um, so, Shill, not a peculiar English name, but uh, from uh, a country, Württemberg, which uh, at the time Herman and Johanna Hill uh, left had not yet been absorbed into Germany, but which was a country to the south and east of Stuttgart. So you see the line of, of mountains from Bellingen and so on. So that, that was the country <coughs> of Württemberg and is now, if your knowledge of German is better than mine, is part of the palatinate of Baden-Württemberg. But the country was under extreme stress, both with internal stress and with Austria and Prussia wanting to take control of the country. Probably the reason why Johanna and Hermann left and eventually settled in Manchester and had three children, uh, Charles Henry, which uh, will be more the subject of this talk, Paul and his sister, uh, Helen. Charles and Paul developed in Manchester a company called Schill Brothers that was uh, very international trading, uh, an awful lot in South America, and uh, even though they travelled a great deal, the families was, were still able to raise children, and this is the first picture I have found 
of Edward uh, Melland. Edward was his first name. Uh, Melland was the name of his mother. But Edward, as a name, soon becomes dropped. Melland takes over. And Olive, you see on the chair, I think, ages perhaps seven and four years old, and a picture taken in Blackpool. So they uh, were obviously there for Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> they, um, Charles and uh, his family moved slowly out of the city of Manchester as it became more and more polluted, initially to Didsbury, then to Macclesfield, and then to Alderley Edge. And this is an 1886 uh, map showing uh, how the village had expanded up the, uh, up the hillside uh, with the development of some very serious Victorian villas. And Croston Towers, which you see middle to the right, was the home from about 1908 of the uh, Charles Schill and his wife Millicent and Olive and Melland. Uh, Millicent had two, yet two sons, but they never got older than uh, infancy. Both died less than one year old. So you see just to the right of the words Croston Towers what the big house was. Um, part of the reason uh, I came to do a little bit of research in this, uh, I used to live uh, in, in the uh, little house at the top left hand corner of the estate. So 3.8 acres and surrounded by uh, little village roads was, was their compound. At the same time that Herman and Johanna left uh, Württemberg and, and uh, settled in Manchester, Croston Towers was built, uh, a stone-built uh, building which was extended just before uh, the uh, Charles and his family arrived with the extension of the relevant billiard room, attic for the servants, entertaining room, and this was for a family of four, with the menfolk probably travelling a great deal at the time, but these houses in those days were really projections of the capability of the menfolk, and you had to have a big house, to entertain your powerful friends and to do business. Melland, uh, after uh, some primary schooling, was then uh, sent to uh, Charterhouse School, uh, Gown Boys uh, House, which is this left hand portion here and surprisingly where we got our miniature schnauzer from. Um, a classic public school in Surrey, and uh, obviously people from very privileged backgrounds go there and go on to bigger and better things. So this is uh, Melland on the right, obviously, <coughs> Olive uh, on the terrace of Uncle Paul's uh, mansion in Withington, Withington Hall, that was eventually demolished and became Tris Christie's uh, Cancer Centre, world famous. And that's the last photograph of Olive that I've managed to find. So here, uh, just as World War I broke out, me, 
Melland was in uh, Valparaiso working for Schill Brothers, came straight back and enlisted in Salford Battalion, Lancashire Fusiliers. Uh, trouble is, with a first in history from Oxford, his background in public school uh, marked him out as office, officer material and that probably did for him because I, I don't know if you've read much up on uh, World War I but the people who really um, were killed in really unusual numbers were the junior officers who had to stand up and say come on chaps So, Melland uh, did, did some training in the UK with his team and then, uh, because he, he was suffering from some illness, and then joined um, Salford Battalion uh, in one of the battles of the Somme called Trones Wood. Now, uh, this is a scan of a very uh, large-scale map, so I hope you can pick up some of the words. But you see the solid line 1st of July, which was the line of, of the British Empire, Commonwealth and French. And it took them till November to get through Trones Wood and uh, hold that line. That was just one of the battles uh, of the Somme that saw something like uh, 419,000 uh, uh, British Empire and Commonwealth soldiers die, plus about 200,000 French and about the same number of Germans. You would wonder, you would wonder why. So Trowingswood didn't look so good uh, after the battle, uh, but we were there uh, four months ago and it's all completely recovered. Um, on the 24th of August, two uh, sorry, 1916, um, Melland was gravely injured and taken to, I think, what must be most euphemistically called a casualty clearing station. Um, it is what it is. He... He died the following day, was temporarily interred near the battlefield, and whether this is him or not, I do not know, but this is a, a typical Imperial War Museum uh, photograph of uh, how the dead were left. This, um, this graveyard we saw in August, not many people seem to visit it, but it's astonishingly neat. The inscription here Sorry, on, on Mellon's tomb, I've typed out at the top, and uh, many thanks to Sarah DeVito in uh, Venice for tracking down uh, the name of the poem when it was written, because strangely enough, uh, Italian Google picks more things up than English Google. There you go. 
the time of Nellan's death, Olive was looking after in, injured World War I servicemen at Endell Street Hospital near um, Covent Garden in London. So she gave something of, her, of herself to the, to the war effort. But immediately after the end of World War I, she uh, went up to Cambridge, to Newnham, to do history, as her brother had done at Oxford, and came down with a second, moved on into, back into Manchester, uh, worked for the BBC, and spent, um, spent the rest of her life uh, in good works. And I'm not saying that in any derogatory way. Um, she was chairman, she was governor, she was committee member of things like the employment uh, associations, uh, gentlewomen's employment, employment associations in Manchester. <coughs> she was involved in Ryland's Library, she was involved in uh, University of Manchester on selecting courses for students and advising on careers and pathways. So she took every possible opportunity to give something to students, to people who had fought in the war and for whatever reason were disabled for uh, wives who were left with no husbands and so on. But towards the end of her life, um, Olive bought this house uh, in another uh, little village near Alderley Edge called Prestry. And it was from uh, Yew Tree House that um, uh, Olive fell ill went back to see her old friend Dorothy Pilkington of Pilkington Glass fame, if anybody knows that, um, and died in 1958. In her will, and that brings us really round to where we are this evening, in her will Olive gave £10,000, which in 1958 was, was a good bequest to the University of Manchester to develop the Mellon Shill Fund for lectures and for publications in international law. She had seen the death of her brother, she had seen the trauma of two world wars, so she thought that by developing international law, it might reduce the risk of armed conflict. Um, I think whether it does or not is perhaps more a subject for you than me, because I am not a lawyer. But that is, is the story so far of Melland and Olive. Um, I might find some more, I might find some more photographs, uh, but I think as far as the actual history of these two young people goes, that's as much as I can tell you. Thank you. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. That was a really interesting talk, and I'm afraid what I'm going to say uh, will be very dull by comparison, and certainly any slides that I may have will not meet yours in terms of great interest. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back uh, at 
Manchester and at the Manchester International Law Centre, uh, abbreviated as MILK still. I do feel you could come up with a better acronym. And it's a great honour to give uh, this year's Mellon Shill lecture. My particular thanks go to Professors Ian Scobie and Jean d'Aspremont for their kind invitation, for their even kinder words of uh, introduction. And I once again want to congratulate you both on reviving this very uh, important uh, lecture series. Uh, what I plan to do is speak for about 30 or 40 minutes, certainly not longer, and then hope we can have a bit of a discussion uh, if there's still time. Um, my aim is to try and shed some light on the way that the International Law Commission operates and to do so by examining what is probably the most contentious issue or topic on its current program of work. That is the immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction. As you know, this is a field that is not governed by treaty law, uh, so it's very much a matter of understanding what is the customary international law uh, on the topic, or indeed what the law should be, and that's really the crux of the whole matter. Are we in the Commission dealing with what the law is, or what the law should be? Uh, in July this year, the Commission adopted a central provision um, of the topic on possible exceptions to official act immunity. And it did so quite exceptionally uh, by a vote. There were 21 in favour, 8 against, and 1 abstention. Uh, those voting against were the members of the Commission from Algeria, China, Germany, India, Russia, Slovenia, the UK, myself, and the United States. Um, I'll come on to discuss how we got to that position. I'll begin by just saying a few words about the International Law Commission itself, though I know you all know uh, a lot about it. Um, it was established 70 years ago by the UN General Assembly. Um, it's a subsidiary organ of the General Assembly and applies the rules and procedure of the General Assembly. It consists of 34 individuals who serve in their personal capacity. Uh, they don't act on instructions from their governments. The elections uh, take place for the whole of the Commission every five years. Um, and importantly, the seats are allocated by regional groups. So the Western European and others group, which includes uh, certain Commonwealth countries and the United States and Canada, uh, has eight seats. That's fixed. But nevertheless, you have to campaign very hard for election, or as it was for me last year, re-election. And like all UN elections, and I say that especially today, um, it's highly political. Uh, very unfortunately, the French member of the Commission uh, failed to be re-elected. He was one of the very best members of the Commission. Uh, and the French language is no longer as well represented as it really should be. Uh, the procedure, uh, very quickly, because it's very relevant to, to what I'm going to say, is that a topic is put on the agenda, and that's almost the most difficult thing, to choose the right topics. A special rapporteur is appointed um, and uh, produces reports. The Commission acts on the basis of these reports, and a special rapporteur is very much the motor of the Commission, but the outcome is very much the Commission's work, because what the special rapporteur puts forward certainly in my case, gets uh, considerably altered by the Commission, and uh, in my experience gets altered uh, for the better. Um, the proposals from the Special Rapporteur usually get sent to a drafting committee, which is where all the real negotiation goes on. Uh, there's no record of what happens in the drafting committee, except 
a quite a substantial report from the chairman of the drafting committee that sets out some of the key points. Um, and then the commission itself adopts the text and most importantly adopts commentaries on the text and the texts have to be read together with the commentaries. You can't really understand the text without the commentaries. And that's done twice. There's usually a first reading. Uh, there's a gap of one year to allow states to comment and others, states, international organizations, or uh, private individuals, uh, academic institutions. And then uh, the text is, the whole proceeding is gone through again on second reading and then the text is sent to the UN General Assembly where states uh, uh, do what they will with it. Uh, an important thing to note is the interaction between the Commission and the member states of the United Nations in the General Assembly. There's a debate every year uh, which often has some very uh, useful statements by, uh, by a large number of states. They're asked to comment in writing tend to get rather fewer written comments because foreign ministries these days are particularly busy uh, and don't get around to it. Um, so what I'd like to concentrate in particular is the distinction that the Commission makes between the codification of international law, that is trying to restate what the law is, and the progressive development of international law. As I'm sure you know, the UN Charter says that the General Assembly is, is there to, one of its tasks is to promote the progressive development of international law and its codification. Um, there's been a lot of debate as to what exactly progressive development means, what codification means. This debate may sound rather theoretical, but it comes up constantly in the Commission. Um, one interesting thing is that the word progressive uh, was originally intended, I think, to mean gradual, step by step. In other words, if you wanted to try and do the whole of international law in one go, you would do it step by step. It didn't bear the meaning of progressive in the sort of political sense of uh, forward-looking or... or uh, Yes, forward-looking. Um, and indeed, the League of Nations had a committee on the progressive codification of international law. So they were certainly using the word progressive there to mean gradual, step-by-step, -step, area of law by law, area of law by area. So, um, the distinction between what the law is and what the law might be or ought to be, is one of great practical importance. Not necessarily for the Commission itself in its day-to-day -day work, but certainly for states and for practitioners, for judges, in particular those, or including those, in the national courts who need to know what the law is on a particular day, at a particular time and who regularly draw upon the Commission's work in order as a kind of shortcut to try and ascertain what the law is. And what I'm going to address this, this today is whether the Commission's work on this topic of immunity of state officials is or should be codification or progressive development, or perhaps both, or perhaps neither. It may be that it's just aiming to set out completely new law in the field. In addition to deciding whether or not something is codification or progressive development, whether it's the law as it is or the law as it might be, um, the question arises whether the Commission should actually say what it thinks it's doing. And uh, states this year in the General Assembly were most insistent that they wanted the Commission to be clear as regards this topic. <coughs> Within the Commission, uh, it's often quite difficult to be clear, if only because members of the Commission have different views as to what the law is, and what the law, uh, and what's new law or development of the law. But there have been quite a few occasions in the past where the Commission has stated very clearly, if you look at the, the Lord's 
state responsibility. There are some articles where the Commission says this is not the law, this is our proposal for new law or for development of the law. Uh, and that happens in other topics too. So we'll come to the subject of uh, immunities. Just to recall that the Commission has made important contributions uh, to the law on international immunities in the past. The Vienna Conventions on Diplomatic Relations and on Consular Relations, uh, the UN Convention on the Jurisdiction Immunities of States, these all originated the text proposed by the Commission. The Commission has also had some less successful ventures into the field of immunities. The uh, New York Convention on Special Missions, which still only has 37 states parties, even though it was adopted in 1969. Uh, the uh, 1975 Convention on the Representation of States in their relations with international organizations, which I think has 34 uh, ratifications when it needs 35 to enter into force. That's after um, nearly 40 years. Um, just very briefly to tell you what's happened on this topic, though, of immunity of state officials before I analyze the, the outcome so far. Um, it's was put on the agenda of the Commission in 2007, so already um, 11 years ago. It's had two very different special rapporteurs, uh, Mr. Kolodkin of the Russian Federation and Professor Escobar Hernandez of Spain. Mr. Kolodkin did not stand again for election in 2011, so uh, although he came back to the Commission later, uh, the Commission appointed a second rapporteur. Uh, Kolodkin produced three very impressive reports, which I would really recommend for anyone interested in the topic. Uh, at the same time, right at the beginning, the Secretariat produced a very detailed study of the topic. And I'd emphasize that uh, the International Law Commission's Part of its work is what is prepared by the Secretariat and some of the very best memoranda on issues of international law are prepared by the Codification Division of the United Nations for the International Law Commission uh, when it takes up topics. Um, Kolodkin's work was, uh, as I've said, very well researched but he, for some reason, didn't actually propose any draft articles. He was being quite smart, I think, and taking things very gradually. Uh, but as regards what I'm going to come on to, which the two most uh, difficult issues uh, under the subject, the first is who, which high-ranking officials should be entitled to complete immunity from jurisdiction, from criminal jurisdiction. Um, he said, in line with the International Court of Justice, that this would be primarily <coughs> heads of state, heads of government, and foreign ministers, but that others could uh, fall within this category. Uh, the problem, as he said, was deciding who, coming up with criteria that justified expanding the um, the, category, the class of people who had jurisdiction, who had immunity, ratione persona beyond, beyond the three. Um, he also looked at the question of whether all officials who have immunity for their official acts, whether there were any exceptions to that immunity. And he concluded uh, that there were none. Or possibly that there was a territorial crime exception if you committed a crime in a foreign state under certain circumstances uh, when you were present without the permission of the state, the kind of crime being an assassination or espionage uh, or whatever 
that, that there might be an exception there, but he didn't conclude there was such an exception. So Golovkin's reports, which I think were, were excellent, may have been regarded as very conservative, uh, but in, in my view, they did largely reflect existing law of ex um, Professor Escobar Hernandez uh, was then appointed, and she went back to the starting point, as it were, came up with her own uh, proposals, uh, and has produced five reports. As a result of these five reports, we have adopted seven draft articles. And I think the best thing I can do is just very quickly run through these seven articles and then focus on the difficult issues. And I don't know if this is going to work. I probably need some technical assistance here. Thank you. Um, so we start with draft article one. You see him told me to press the mouse. Um, draft Article 1 uh, is about the scope of the articles, um, what they cover, and more importantly, what they don't cover. And if you see paragraph 2, which is very important, it says that the present draft articles are without prejudice to the immunity from criminal jurisdiction enjoyed under the special rules of international law in particular, persons connected with diplomatic missions, consular posts, special missions, international organizations, and military forces. So what these articles are concerned with are people who are not governed by existing uh, treaties or the customary international law that corresponds to existing treaties in these fields. So everything to do with diplomats, for example, is untouched. So we're really dealing with officials uh, who are basically, uh, or chiefly, at home, in the government, uh, working for the government, uh, not posted abroad. And then we move on to draft article two. Um, this, I think, need to detain us. It's two definitions, there will have to be more, of key terms, state officials, and acts performed in an official capacity. Uh, there are difficulties with that, but I won't go into it. Then, um, this is a very important provision, Article 3. It says, heads of state, heads of government, and ministers for foreign affairs enjoy immunity ratione persona, which, as you know, is um, a lawyer's way of saying uh, complete immunity uh, from the exercise of foreign criminal jurisdiction. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's limited to what people refer to as the Troika, uh, heads of state, heads of government, and foreign ministers. Um, that was um, controversial within the Commission. Um, as you recall, the International Court of Justice, in the arrest warrant case, um, said uh, that It was firmly established that in addition to diplomatic and consular agents, certain holders of high-ranking office in a state, such as the head of state, head of government, and minister for foreign affairs, enjoy immunity from jurisdiction in other states, both civil and criminal. So, such as um, suggests that it's not limited to the Troika. And indeed, the case law this country uh, and elsewhere uh, has recognized that other ministers who need to travel a lot, such as ministers of defense or ministers of international trade, may also enjoy this uh, immunity uh, ratione persona. Uh, in the commission, that was not generally accepted. There, were, there was even one member who said it should only be the head of state who enjoyed immunity. Quite a few said ministers of foreign affairs, the International Court had just made this up. They hadn't really had the evidence when they held that a foreign minister, um, in that case, was entitled to immunity. To which the answer is that uh, even if that were true, states 
have all welcomed that judgment. No state that I'm aware of has criticized it. Um, people at universities may have criticized it, but uh, if you're looking for state practice, that judgment itself has led to um, the adoption of, of that rule. So there was a big debate, there's an open debate as to whether this uh, is um, the right rule or whether it shouldn't be extended to others, and if so, how do you define the others? And in the, uh, the General Assembly states, when they talked about this provision, uh, quite a few of them said that they didn't agree that this immunity was limited to these, uh, these three uh, office holders. Now, I've done something completely wrong here. More assistance, please. <laughs> We're getting to the end of my exciting slides. Uh, but uh, Article 4. Oh, I see. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this just states that it covers, the immunity covers all acts. And there are no exceptions. Uh, that may disappoint uh, what some people might call human rightists, but no exceptions. So no exceptions for genocide, for war crimes, for crimes against humanity, for aggression. <coughs> uh, that was uncontroversial within the Commission, and I think largely uncontroversial among the states. And then we come on to um, the next article, 5, persons enjoying immunity rationi materiae, um, which refers to all state officials. However high or however low uh, the state official is, they enjoy immunity in respect of their official acts from the exercise of foreign criminal jurisdiction. Uh, that was adopted without uh, much difficulty, uh, but it was understood that that was subject to what we might decide later as regard exceptions to immunity. Um, and the next article, likewise, was not controversial. It says it only applies with respect to acts performed in an official capacity, which we defined earlier. And then we come to... Uh, the problem. Draft Article 7. This is the article that was adopted with that vote that I mentioned uh, right at the beginning. Um, it was highly controversial within the Commission. The debate about it, the controversy, goes right back to the beginning of the topic. It had been um, debated on the basis of the reports by uh, the Russian Special Rapporteur, Roman Kolodkin, uh, his reports back in 2008 and 2011, but it became particularly acute in 2016 and 2017 uh, in the light of the second Special Rapporteur's uh, fifth report. Uh, she proposed an article which was actually quite different from this, <coughs> termed limitations and exceptions to immunity rationi materiae, um, the report, in the view of many of us, was less than clear. Um, in places, she claimed that this reflected existing law, customary international law. In other places, uh, she acknowledged that there was divergent state practice and that what she proposed referred only to a trend in the law. She said that, her view, in her view, the Commission should approach the topic, particularly this question, from the perspective of both codification and progressive development of international law. And then she said the challenge for the Commission was to decide whether to support a developing trend in the field of immunity or whether to halt such development. Uh, that uh, rather partial, you might think, description of the challenge uh, was not um, shared by all the members of the Commission. 
Um, quite a lot of members of the Commission took the view that uh, her report was not based on a sound analysis of the case law, of the state practice in the form of legislation or statements by states, and um, that um, therefore the proposal was for new law, which of course the Commission can propose, but which then ought to form be a proposal for a new treaty on the subject, which states can adopt if they want, as opposed to a statement of the existing law, which might just be left, and um, <coughs> which would then be regarded by courts and tribunals and states as, as a reflection of, of existing law. So there was a lack of clarity as to the purpose of the proposal. Um, there was also a feeling that it was very important that if there were to be exceptions, they should be accompanied by procedural safeguards, because the risk of uh, abuse of um, prosecutions um, of officials of foreign states is a very considerable. <coughs> I've seen a lot of uh, campaigning groups who try to prosecute people from certain states uh, in the courts. Uh, and there was a feeling that it was very important that procedural safeguards be introduced, but the Special Rapporteur had not uh, proposed any procedural safeguards yet. She said she was going to, but they weren't before the Commission when it was asked to adopt uh, this uh, draft article. Um, we had a lot of procedural <coughs> debates about this. Uh, the first thing was that uh, a number of us said that we shouldn't refer her draft to the drafting committee, that it was premature uh, to do so. Um, the debate on whether to refer it to the drafting committee was stopped by a procedural motion from one member of the commission saying that uh, the debate should be terminated. We had a vote on that and the majority they were terminating the debate on whether to send it to the drafting committee, which is the kind of tactic that you might find in the sixth committee uh, in the General Assembly when states are there, but it's not uh, usual in the Commission, at least not perhaps since the end of the, the Cold War. Um, it then went to the drafting committee um, and In the drafting committee, we had the same debate. We worked quite well, I think. We improved the text. We made it clearer and simpler. And uh, uh, the list is very different from the list that the special rapporteur proposed. She had, in addition, a new paragraph saying that uh, crimes of corruption, whatever they are, should not be uh, subject to, should not be subject to immunity. She had this territorial crime exception that I mentioned, saying that shouldn't be subject to immunity. Both of those provisions were not adopted. Uh, on the other hand, one or two additions were made. The crime of apartheid was added. Torture was added, even though torture is sometimes, anyway, a crime against humanity. And enforced disappearances was added. But some things were not added. Uh, slavery was not added. Uh, people trafficking was not added. Uh, above all, aggression, the crime of aggression was not added, though there were strong views that it should be added. Um, this led one member to describe what we were doing as arbitrary progressive development. People were just putting in what they wanted, not putting in what they didn't want, based entirely on uh, their own feelings, not based on any real criteria. So there we are. One thing we did do is at least clarified the meaning of these various terms, genocide, crimes against humanity, by putting in a second paragraph which refers to the definitions in existing treaties. So there are at least clear definitions which the Special Rapporteur hadn't proposed initially. 
There was another proposal just to say it should apply to any crimes under international law and leave it open. Uh, that was received very little support in the, the Commission. But there we are. We have that text. Um, some of us said it shouldn't go back from the drafting committee to the plenary until we had the procedural safeguards. And we could look at it as an overall package. But again, in the drafting committee, the majority wanted to send it back. And it was sent back. And when we got to the plenary, we said we really don't want this text to, I say we, the, those who voted no, I guess, the eight or so, we don't want this text to go forward at this stage. But the, um, the majority insisted, so we were left with no uh, choice but to have a vote on the matter. The Commission, I don't think, has voted uh, for many years on anything of real substance. Uh, it occasionally votes on minor matters where people don't mind which way it goes, just to take a decision quickly, but even that's fairly rare, and mainly in the drafting committee. But this was a vote on a real issue of principle, which the Commission had not engaged in uh, for 20 or 30 years, I think. I've not looked at the full history. Certainly in the early days, the Commission voted all the time. They had numerous votes on the breadth of the territorial sea when they were dealing with um, the law of the sea. Uh, and every proposal was defeated. And then they adopted a, proposed a text saying we can't agree on the breadth of the territorial sea and that was defeated. So uh, they did vote in the past um, without it leading to, to very constructive, well, sometimes it may have led to constructive uh, results. Um, the question is whether this text reflects customary international law. There is certainly the possibility that domestic courts, judges who don't really know international law, who don't understand the workings of the International Law Commission, may have this text put before them by clever counsel who will say this is customary international law, the International Law Commission has adopted this, and uh, the record, however, I think would very clearly show that that's not the case. Firstly, we have the vote uh, that I've referred to. Secondly, explanations of vote were very clear that whatever else this wasn't existing law, these exceptions. Uh, the commentary, and I mentioned at the beginning the importance of the commentaries. If you look at the commentary that's been adopted for this article, it must be one of the longest commentaries uh, that the Commission's ever done, and each paragraph contradicts the next paragraph. It says some members think this, and then there's a lot of case law cited in the footnote. And the next paragraph said other members disagree with that and think all the case law is, uh, is rubbish, that it, well, it doesn't say what uh, those who favour these exceptions says it said. Um, and, and so it goes on. It goes on for, for 30 or 40 paragraphs. And is, I think, very clear uh, evidence that this is not customary international law. For more evidence, uh, it would be good to... There are many things you could look at, but if you look particularly at the debate that took place in the Sixth Committee, the, the General Assembly, where states comment on this particular text as it came from the Commission. This debate took place about two or three weeks ago, uh, but the speeches are all available on the UN website. And I think I could summarize it as follows, though I may be biased. Uh, firstly, very few states considered that this draft article reflected custom international law. I think I noted two states who said that. Um, a majority of states supported this draft article uh, in some form or another, but most of those who said that um, considered that it was a proposal for new law, a proposal lex ferenda, at least, a progressive development proposal. A considerable number of states told the Commission, or requested the Commission, to be clear about its status. They said, we want to know 
whether the Commission considers this to be existing law or law next forender, progressive development. Um, there was a significant minority, probably larger than the Commission itself, um, which opposed this draft article. Um, the list of exceptions was criticised um, quite strongly from various directions. In particular, uh, the question whether the crime of aggression, which as you know has just been added to the statute of the International Criminal Court, um, and will presumably come into force very soon if it hasn't already, um, whether that uh, should be included. There was quite a strong feeling in the Commission that it shouldn't, because if it did, it would politicise the whole text and make it very unlikely that the text would be acceptable to, to many states if it added the crime of aggression, which is a very different sort of crime, as you know, from the, um, the crimes listed here. Um, virtually all those who spoke considered that this text could only be accepted if it were accompanied by procedural safeguards, and I'll come on to those in a, in a minute or so. Um, and then quite a lot of states um, expressed concern that the Commission was divided, and they urged the Commission to move cautiously and to work towards a consensus on the subject. So we got quite a clear steer from the states that they didn't like the fact we'd had to go to a vote. They thought we should try to, to work together and reach a consensus. So um, I'll jump the rest of what I was going to say about draft article 7. And come on very briefly to uh, the lessons that might be learned from this not very glorious uh, episode in the Commission's work. Uh, and I can state them very briefly. Uh, first, I think the Commission needs to exercise great care when it's choosing a topic and that it shouldn't select a topic on which it expects there to be diametrically opposed views, because that's likely to lead to a failure, what I would call a trade crash, which isn't helpful for the Commission, and it's not helpful, more importantly, for the development of international law. Um, having said that, even failed topics on the Commission can lead to some useful results. There was a topic a few years ago on uh, the obligation to extradite or prosecute, where we devoted a lot of time to considering whether it was a rule of customary international law or not. Complete, well, the topic was wrapped up with a final report. There was no output uh, in any real sense. But there was an excellent paper by the Secretariat, uh, the best thing I've seen on Amadei <coughs> <coughs> Judicari, analysing the 40 or so existing treaties on the subject, dividing them into categories. That was uh, very useful in the case Belgium against Senegal before the International Court of Justice, and is referred to at least in the separate opinions in that case. So, as often happens with the Commission, uh, some very valuable work is produced by the, by the Secretariat. Um, so that's the first lesson, is to exercise care in choosing topics. I'm not saying it was wrong to choose this topic, uh, but uh, in retrospect, it might turn out to have been. We'll see what happens. Um, secondly, it emphasizes the importance of this distinction between uh, progressive development, or lex ferenda, and codification. Um, it's a debate that's been around since the very beginning of the Commission, 70 years ago, and it's still very much with us. Um, that leads to the question whether the Commission should indicate whether its proposals are existing law or a development of the law. 
Uh, that is difficult sometimes, but I personally uh, believe that it should be done. There are others on the Commission who take the view that we shouldn't try to do it, but it seems to me very important, uh, and especially where the subject matter is likely to come before domestic courts, because domestic courts, the judges are not experts in international law, they can't really understand necessarily uh, all the significance of the work of the Commission, uh, and it's very helpful to them if there is a clear statement as to whether something is, is the law or is a proposal uh, for new law. Um, another lesson, I think, is that when the Commission uh, claims to be codifying existing law, it should be quite strict in its approach, and it should uh, live by the methodology that it's recommended, for example, under the topic identification of customary international law. Uh, you can read the reports of the Special Rapporteur uh, on this topic and see whether you think uh, she has followed uh, those, um, that approach or not. But I think in general it's very important that the Commission uh, should follow uh, standard practice for identifying customary international law because if it doesn't, it risks uh, losing its uh, credibility. Um, I think a fourth lesson is that it's very useful to have a clear idea early on in a topic what the outcome is going to be. Are you aiming for a study, <coughs> uh, which is essentially what the topic uh, that I'm a special rapporteur for is going to be, a set of conclusions with commentary, nothing binding, uh, just something that hopefully gives guidelines, gives signposts to to anyone concerned with identifying customer international, or are you aiming to make proposals that will become a treaty? And if we knew the answer to that for this topic, it might be much easier to achieve a consensus. Some of those who strongly opposed Article 7 might be willing to uh, agree to it if it was clear that what was being proposed was a progressive development, was intended, as a proposal that states could, if they want, pick up and put into the form of a treaty which they would voluntarily accept. So I think deciding early on uh, what the outcome, what outcome you're aiming for is, is helpful for the Commission. A fifth um, lesson, if you like, is uh, whether to proceed by way of voting or whether to strive to reach a consensus. I must say, personally, I think it is always better to try and reach agreement, to reach a consensus, rather than uh, proceeding by vote. But there are other views. Uh, it can be that you have a recalcitrant, very small minority who hold out, and it can block the development of the law if you're bound always to, to go for a consensus. But, as I said, since uh, the end of the Cold War, and perhaps even a bit before that, uh, the Commission has tended to work by consensus. It has achieved agreement on many things, and uh, I think uh, it's much better to, to try for that. And uh, I regret that we didn't do that on this topic this year, but perhaps, hopefully, um, in the future, we will. And I'll just leave you with a last uh, thought. Um, it's been suggested actually by me, that the International Law Commission is a potentially dangerous place. And what I mean by that is that uh, it's not dangerous in itself, but it's dangerous because of the attitude of others, including courts and tribunals, who seem to give too much credence to what the Commission does. They tend to uh, follow its work, say that it reflects existing law, whether that work is good, or whether it's bad, or whether it's somewhere in between. Uh, what people need to do when they're looking at uh, the work of the Commission is look very carefully. Firstly, is the Commission intending to state the law or to propose new law, progressive development? Um, how well has it done it? What were the materials on the basis of which it worked? And 
unless that is done, it seems to me that the Commission is a dangerous place. What it suggests to me is that uh, the members of the Commission need to work very cautiously, very thoroughly in preparing their work. I'm not saying they don't, usually, but occasionally when they don't, uh, it can lead to uh, serious risks. And my, not my fear, but I think this text could be regarded by courts as reflecting custom law, unless the courts themselves approach the matter with great care and see all the uh, background which makes it, to my mind, clear that it does not reflect existing law. That, of course, is the duty of the lawyers who appear before the courts, uh, and I hope that uh, when they read what I've said today, they will reach the right conclusion. And I do propose to try and uh, put on your website uh, the text, the full text of what I would have said today. So thank you very much. sense of written law as opposed to relying on customary law. Uh, I don't think you can generalize. Uh, the problem with written law is it gets out of date and it's less flexible. Customary international law is less clear but is more flexible and can develop uh, in a fast developing world. So I think the advantages and disadvantages of each, that's a general response. I don't know if you were talking about this particular subject and saying really uh, wouldn't it be better if this was the law because it would uh, prevent crimes against humanity, let's say. Well, would it? Um, I think it seems obvious that that's so, that you do want to make these international crimes uh, effective so they can be effectively prosecuted. But you have to look at the other side of the coin, which is that uh, politically motivated prosecutions can lead to great uh, uh, tensions between states. Some of these cases which spring up out of nowhere when someone is arrested, a senior official uh, or even a head of state of another country, uh, can lead to a former head of state, as the case of Pinochet, can lead to, to great tensions. And we see uh, the problems even with international criminal courts. And I have to, I should have said at, the, at some point that this has nothing to do with immunity before international criminal courts. This is immunity from national criminal jurisdiction. Uh, but there is a lot of uh, uh, adverse criticism of the international criminal courts because when you get universal jurisdiction, it seems to be uh, a present the criminal court is entirely directed at uh, situations in Africa. Uh, when you have universal jurisdiction combined with uh, no immunity, it can lead to, to grave problems. Uh, we've had a number of politically motivated, but I would say politically motivated, attempts to arrest visiting uh, uh, officials in um, the UK, um, Israeli officials in particular, uh, and by campaigning groups. Uh, I look at him with some trepidation on that one. Not that he's a campaigning group. But, um, we actually had a very interesting case in the English courts 
last August, where uh, a high Egyptian defense official came to the UK on an official visit, and he was then charged, or there was an attempt to arrest him for uh, the overthrow of the Morsi uh, government, uh, where uh, people were killed in the squares of Cairo, and uh, the courts looked into the question of whether he was had immunity because he was on, an, on a special mission. Um, they didn't look at this question of official acts, but they could have done it. They looked particularly on whether he was, had immunity because he was on a special mission and held that he was. And that special mission immunity was customary international law. And to look at that, they looked carefully at the ILC's provisions on identification of customary international law, which was quite interesting. Um, it's now on appeal, so we'll see what the Court of Appeal has to say about it. Um, but I think you have to balance the need to avoid impunity, which is very worthy, with the risk to international relations that uh, these prosecutions can, can cause, unless there are procedural safeguards. And I didn't go into the procedural safeguards. I could have rattled off a list of what they might be. And I'd recommend you look at uh, the American members' uh, report of the last session of the International Law Commission, which is on the American Journal of International Law website, because he's got, he sets out what uh, he thinks the procedural safeguards should be. So, so we're going to take three questions at a time. Is that fine with you? Michael? Yes, as long as I write them down. Okay. Um, all right, my question is about um, links up to um, state immunity. That's immunity for uh, state officials and linking that up to uh, state immunity. Yes. Because um, state officials really, if they commit crimes, the state is vicariously liable in the course of doing their, their work. Yeah. Or but generally in the course of not even doing their work privately, they then commit crimes and uh, but they, they are still immune. Now with the immunity they already have under the state, if they are, the state has to be vicariously liable, Yep. And their own immunity that they have given them continuous protection. Is it not the case that they are, uh, the International Law Commission haven't failed to even have to take some exceptions to this? Is it not trying to create a culture of impunity that these officials do not have any, I mean, people do not have any way they can hold these people responsible? That's question number one. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, I mean, you, you seem to be very concerned about the idea of um, national courts picking up on on any reports that come out of this, and that they might do so out of ignorance. Yeah. Of course, custom, I mean, in, in some ways, rely is based on sort of positivist procedural thing that states could be doing things out of ignorance rather than out of a sort of conscious determination of the law. But that practice in itself could have a sort of snowball effect. That. Yeah. Um, when, when you have one case, they, they cite the, the International Commission and the court might rule in their favour. And of course, you can bet with the next case, then they'll also be citing that judgment too. And uh, they'll sort of continue in that way. And is that a desirable? Well, obviously, it's, there are obviously undesirable elements to that, but uh, yeah. is that a good Okay. Hi. Um, so, my question would be what was the majority's rationale for thinking that these crimes could actually be in the jurisdiction? before the jurisdiction of a national judge. Why did they think a national judge should be able to? Right. Okay, well, the first one was about the relationship between state immunity and the immunity of officials from criminal jurisdiction. I mean, I think one very important point is that if a state uh, claims immunity for its official, that is because it admits that the act was an official Act. So questions of state responsibility immediately come into play on the international level. Uh, states actually don't usually uh, claim with immunity if an assassination has taken place or, or something like that has gone on. Um, we had a case in the UK, the Courts Back case a few years ago, where Mongolia did in fact claim immunity for the uh, 
severe ill treatment by one of their intelligence officers uh, in Berlin of the Mongolian national. But that was a government that was two or three governments after the one that had actually done it. So uh, they, that's, that's a rare case where, where a state does claim immunity in respect and admits that it, one of these crimes was an official act. But I think that it's important that it's not impunity as such. The state itself accepts uh, responsibility for the act at the international level. Now, another thing is whether the state has immunity from the domestic courts. It might well. But at least at the international level, you have a claim. Um, the point about national courts picking up out of ignorance. Well, yes, you're absolutely right. If a national court comes to a judgment that's wrong, that can end up as state practice which can contribute to the development of the law. But as I think you also said, uh, that's not uh, necessarily desirable. Uh, what it would mean if they're relying on the work of the International Law Commission that isn't supported by states uh, is that they're effectively being it's not actually very democratic in the sense that states uh, have no role in this. It was left to these 34 individuals to uh, decide what the law is, and the courts are going to just accept that. I mean, this is the argument we have that's going on about the state responsibility articles. Uh, should they be turned into a treaty? Because if they're just left as what the International Law Commission decided, then you're handing over states are abdicating their power as the lawmakers and allowing the International Law Commission to do that. I don't buy that in that case because states have now for 15 years expressed their strong support for what the International Law Commission has done in the Sixth Committee and the courts have uh, relied on it in many respects and no states that I'm aware of have said this is, this is wrong. Though they might on certain provisions like the ones about just COVID. So, so I think you're right to point out that this could happen, but it's very undesirable. It makes the problem even worse, if not only do you get a wrong decision, but that wrong decision helps to contribute to, to wrong law, I would say. Um, the question about the rationale of the majority in um, thinking that this is the law that national courts should should give effect to, or, or thinking that it ought to. Do they, do they think that they must be introduced? Yes. I think um, it's a very good question that I ask, because most of the majority who support this, as I've said, don't claim that it's existing law, but they claim <coughs> that they say it's what the law should be. This is what the law, how the law should develop. And they base this upon uh, what they refer to as the values of the international community or the, um, the basic principles of the international legal order. Phrases like this, and I say, well, come on, list the values of the international community for me. I don't know what you're talking about. And they just think you're very old-fashioned if you don't understand what the values of the international community are. I mean, it's obvious that the prevention of genocide is a very important value, but it has to be balanced against others. And uh, I really don't think um, that their arguments have been coherent, um, even though instinctively uh, they support this. The balance within the Commission is quite interesting, because 34 members, if you look roughly at who they are, um, by my calculation, about two-thirds are primarily former government lawyers, like myself, or even current government lawyers, like the Chinese member or the Russian Kolobkin that totally left, um, or practitioners, primarily government lawyers or private practitioners. And one-third are primarily academic. Now that's a very rough division because um, many people are both. But just looking, putting it in two columns, I come to, to that. And I think that's a, that's a good balance because we're not 
it's not our job to do academic work, it's our job to come up with practical uh, outcomes that uh, states will uh, be prepared to accept, that states will find helpful. That's our primary job. We're an organ of the General Assembly uh, aimed at developing law in, in conjunction with states. We take their comments very seriously, um, particularly on the second reading when we've had a lot of comments. Uh, and we go through them one by one and say yes or no, basically, to, to all the comments we've received. I've not really answered your question very well, other than to say that I think it's a very good question, and I don't have an answer for it. Thank you very much for your very informing and intriguing lecture. So I have been pretty much provoked to ask this question. I think this is a very classical question, and you have heard thousands of times, but I feel like I must ask okay. this question. So my question is, what is the difference between the identification of existing law, custom international law, Lex Lata, and describing what is existing law, Lex Lata, because it seems to me that it, 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 this is a very thin line when someone like court has not clearly stated beforehand it is custom international law existing law. So I feel like the, I, 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 I see itself does not seem to have the criteria like what density of state practice, judgment, or whatever element is needed to describe it is existing law. Of course, I do understand that. Uh, I see have more procedural safeguard because you have to go through the multiple reviewing process by drafting committee, general assembly, but still I would like to know what is your view about this argument. I think you're asking about the uh, distinction between deciding what is current customary international law, or what was customary international law in a particular, at a particular time, which is what courts often have to do. They have to decide what law was 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, or, or whatever. And um, you said describing Lex Lata, but I think you probably meant uh, um, discovering it, or somehow uh, making it up. Or, no, no, actually, describe means like IOC, they have two kinds of job, which means finding the existing role yes. and also progressive. Uh, yeah. progressive they progressive. have two jobs. One yeah. is uh, codifying, codifying existing law, yeah. and the other is making proposals for how the law should be, right. which is described as progressive development. So, right. but arguably, is, that's only where there's some law and you have to clarify it and you have to develop it. Yes. You have some basis, so it's not entirely new mm -hmm. law necessarily. And My it, question is so codification and also identification. Or, so my question is like codification, which is it also includes some. You have to identify what is custom international law, yes. like court does. Then my question is, how do you identify? Because there there seems to be certain criteria that you must have. In, in codifying the custom international law, what density of state practice is needed, no. what type of judgment is needed, what number of judgment is needed, or the, those criteria is needed. Yes. But I'm not, I'm not quite sure that this criteria is not always, if this is clear enough. So I'm well, wondering what you think about this argument. Well, that really is the other topic that I referred to, uh, the one for which I'm special rapporteur, identification of customary international law. And I think you can if you've read the 16 uh, conclusions with the commentary, uh, that is the best that we've been able to come up with so far. We may improve it on second reading. Uh, and obviously, it's not an exact science. It's not, you can't just put in facts at one end and come out with this is law or not law at the other. It depends upon uh, experience and the feel for things. It depends upon the particular type of rule uh, that you're talking about. If it's passing through straits, then pay a lot of attention to the views of the straits, states, etc. So there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, subtleties in the way it's done, but what we've tried to do with the exercise on identification of customer international law is set some uh, signposts or guidelines uh, 
particularly aimed at uh, lawyers who are not expert in international law. And more and more nowadays, uh, lawyers who are not expert in international law, whether they're judges, whether they're uh, lawyers in departments other than foreign ministries and defense ministries, whether they're practitioners, they may from time to time have to deal with a question of customary international law. They may be family lawyers, and then some question of customary international law comes up. So we're aimed particularly at, uh, at those um, non-experts. Uh, there's a lot of guidance to be found in the judgments of the International Court of Justice, if you read them very carefully, even going back to the early days of the permanent court. Um, there's some recent ones that set out pretty firmly what the position is, I think. Of course, you can't quantify it, uh, but you, you know what you have to look for, and you have to have a fairly strong case <coughs> to decide something is a rule of custom international law. Um, often criticized by saying that we're being too rigorous and it makes it difficult to find that some things are rule of customary international law. Well, quite frankly, it ought to be difficult. If you're finding that some things are rule of customary international law that's binding on all states, you ought to have pretty good evidence that it does reflect the practice of states and their uh, acceptance of that practice as law. And, uh, so it is a relatively rigorous exercise, but not, not an impossible one. But you're not convinced by what you've done. No, but it's, well, I do understand the difficulty of this question and also topic. Yeah. So thank you very much for answering. Yeah, thank you for your insights. I was wondering if you could provide more information about the exact role and the appointment procedures of the special rapporteur. And then second, if there are um, patterns as for the problems um, with the special rapporteur in majority Islamic states. Sorry? The last question. So the, the last question is, um, from your experience, um, are there like particular issues or is there a pattern of problems as regards a special rapporteur in um, Muslim or majority Muslim states? Yeah. Like for example, Iran. <coughs> so is, are there certain issues that pop up with these countries? Is there a pattern or not? Well, on the question of appointing special rapporteurs, it's obviously very important, but it tends to be the member of the commission that proposed the topic. And you know if you're going to put the topic on the agenda, you're probably going to get the special rapporteur who proposed it. It's not always the case, but that's often the case. Uh, what happens when the special rapporteur leaves the commission? Then you have to find somebody else. And of course, with some topics, like the law of treaties, law of state responsibility, there have been multiple special rapporteurs. I think they've usually chosen a good person to succeed and to carry on. But it's always good, it, it, you know, not always, it's sometimes good to have multiple special rapporteurs because you get a new vision of things and you, you see things in a different light. And you see that with the law of treaties, with state responsibility. The commission changed its direction and I think changed for the better each time because they were building on the earlier work. So that's a good thing. So far as uh, the question about uh, Rapporteurs coming from uh, Islamic states, uh, I can't see that there is any problem or any difference. Uh, all the members of the commission are uh, educated in public international law, uh, which I think is a common language, and uh, which is basically taught in the same way whether you're from uh, well, whichever country you come from. So there's no problem with special rapporteurs coming from a particular any particular region or uh, religion or what have you. So one final <coughs> question and then I'll add one myself. I'm hoping this is a brief question. Um, I'm more interested in the practicalities of how do you reach the decision and I think it relates to one of the questions we had earlier uh, of Article 7, um, Paragraph 1 of which crimes are included and which crimes are excluded, how do you go about deciding the, what, I, what are the criteria, basically? Yeah. And it seemed you touched upon this being a difficult issue. Yes. Well, um, it is a difficult issue. If you're going to have exceptions, 
it would be quite natural to say the so-called core crimes, the crimes which happen to be within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, and that's the first three, the crime of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes, um, are obvious, I think, if you're going to have exceptions. Uh, less obvious would be the crime of aggression, because that is a very special political crime that uh, involves sort of central issues of sovereignty of the state. And we have a very curious definition of aggression anyway. <coughs> it's been adopted in Kampala. So that would be a more difficult issue. And one might decide not to include it for political reasons because we want the whole text to be acceptable to states and that would make it not acceptable. <coughs> um, the others uh, were added um, a bit at random. I mean, the crime of apartheid, a lot of people said it's ridiculous putting that in, it's a crime that's over and done with. Uh, why are we mentioning that as opposed to slavery? <coughs> Modern slavery, slavery is a real serious issue these days. That would be a more obvious crime, uh, also covered by international conventions, like the Convention Against Apartheid. Uh, torture, um, well, the Convention Against Torture is very widely ratified. Uh, torture is often a crime against humanity, but for that it has to reach a certain level of organization. And uh, uh, so, so that was, people wanted to add it, and it's quite difficult to argue against torture. Um, enforced disappearance, there's just a recent convention on the subject. People uh, thought it was important. Uh, but as I said, uh, our Slovene colleague, Ambassador Petrich described uh, what we've done as uh, arbitrary progressive development because he said it's completely arbitrary what's been added. And other members uh, argued very strongly that we had to have some criteria. Well, one criteria is in the heading where it says in respect to the following crimes under international law. But we all know that crimes under international law is a very vague term that means different things to different people. Um, but I, I would agree with you. I think it is arbitrary. I think if we confined it to A, B, and C, uh, then that would have been less arbitrary because these are uh, crimes that have been recognized in the Rome Statute, at least have been crimes of concern to, uh, to the international community as a whole, etc., etc. Your question, sir. Michael, if I may. You knew I would come with something. I mean, you got us provoked, uh, and, and thanks a lot for, for delivering a lecture which is far beyond all expectations and which, which provides a lot of food for thought. Obviously, you don't like Article 7, and, and, and to be honest, I'm with you. I can, I can certainly live with your, with your reservations. But actually, drawing on, on your skepticism towards Article 7, I would like to, to go back to where you started your lecture, which is this, the RLC way of codifying things, and the RLC uh, the necessity of the ILC to, to, to state whether something is codification of progressive development, yeah. which is what you started the lecture with. Um, well, if I understand you well, you think that the ILC for each provision should say whether something is custom or not. Uh, and, and I wonder, and I may beg to actually disagree, whether really this is uh, that self-evident. Well, first of all, in saying the ILC should always say whether something is custom, in a way, you refer to your own work on the identification of custom, and so you, in a way you say, well, the LC should listen to me. Um, that's the first thing. The second is, uh, is that, and I think that ties in with, with, the, with the earlier question of, of Ms. Megro, which is, isn't that all a bit artificial? Uh, if, is Article 7 custom? Well, people who support the policy consideration behind it would say it's, it is, and those like you who think immunity uh, or absence of immunity in these cases of bad idea, we would say it's not custom. So there will never be agreement on the state of custom within the RLC, despite your, your great guidelines and conclusions. So isn't that a bit artificial to just try to reduce the debate as to whether a certain provision provided or, or put forward by the RLC is custom or not? And remember here in this respect the, the controversy of Article 16 on the Articles on Social, the article on social Responsibility and Complicity. The RLC said it's not custom, and the court said it's custom. So isn't that all artificial to just, to just well, shape the debate in terms of 
codification of progressive development? Should it, should it be safer, in a way more transparent, not to say anything? Just to say, this is the provision we propose, and this is the supporting authorities. We have judgments going in this direction, we have scholars going supporting this, end of the story, without the LC passing a judgment on whether this is customary law or not, uh, which, which, which would be a judgment always a bit artificial. Well, firstly, I didn't say that the ILC, I don't think I said the ILC should always state whether things are reflect custom or <coughs> progressive development, that's for Emma. I just said I thought it was good that they should do so in some cases. And this, above all, is a case where they should do so, because this is a case, this is a, an issue that is going to come before uh, domestic courts in the here and now. And, uh, I don't want domestic courts having to start from scratch with these really difficult issues, uh, looking at all the cases. Uh, maybe if it gets as far as the Supreme Court, they'll have to and they will. But we can't be sure that uh, these criminal cases tend to come up before a magistrate and somebody can be arrested and uh, put away uh, the same afternoon. Uh, it's, it's really would be very helpful if there could be clear guidance. Now, of course, you say it's artificial. It's not artificial when you're arguing before a court. You have to say whether something is or is not the law, and the judge has to say whether it is or is not the law. So it's not an artificial distinction. It may be a very difficult one, uh, but it's one that the commission has quite often expressed. Uh, I wasn't aware that the commission itself had said that Article 16 wasn't custom international law, but of course you're, I'm sure you're right. But they did say that some other provisions of the State Responsibility Article are not custom international law. There's one um, project that we did uh, called Expulsion of Aliens, which states uniformly said they thought we shouldn't do, because states like expelling aliens and they didn't want any constraints. Uh, and we, uh, we went on with the subject, we ploughed on with the subject, and at the end, uh, we wrote saying most of this is progressive development, so don't worry, states. But they were still worried, I think, because they thought our courts would just read the text you proposed. They won't look at this, uh, what you said in by way of introduction to it. Uh, and states uniformly said they didn't like those draft articles in the civil committee. Uh, after a lot of hard work and good work by the commission and its special rapporteur, that's an example of a topic that probably should never have been taken up. I don't know that I've answered your question, but, but I have answered it. So. You have. <laughs> okay, it's um, time for us to end in what we're But before that, sure, we, yeah, before that, we'd like to thank Sir Michael and Mr. Dilloway for two excellent presentations tonight.